All right. Well, welcome everyone, and thank you, Leslie, for allowing me to give this talk. Uh, my name is Ricardo McLeese, and today I'll be presenting on getting the USGS record straight part two. And for those of you that were not in attendance last year, this is actually a continuation from last year's pre presentation. And I'll actually be covering the progress that has been made within the past year, challenges that were presented, and also what lies ahead for this project, challenges and hurdles and everything like that. And one thing I wanted to kind of start off with, um, I had this picture here of uh, the William Cobbin collection. Um, and this is actually one of the first collections we started to work with, started to sort through to get this USGS Paleo database off the ground. And he is actually a very highly respected retired USGS paleontologist who was responsible for naming and defining most of the 71 Upper Cretaceous Ammonite zones of the Western Interior United States. Um, these zones and actually corresponding ages are recognized and used by geologists worldwide as the standard. So I just thought that was kind of a cool tidbit of information to share everyone to share with everyone. And also too, um, I just want to point out the title for this presentation, Getting the USGS Paleontology Record Straight really fits perfectly within this presentation, and you will actually see why on the last slide. So I just wanted to make everybody aware of that. So slide two, uh, we have core science systems, and I thought I'd just give a little bit of feedback. I know Sky touched on a little bit, but this is just the program that I'm currently involved with at USGS. Um, I'm in the program uh, known as CSASNL Core Science Analytics Synthesis and Libraries. We implement and promote standards for best practices to enable efficient data-driven science decision making at multiple scales. But now just to provide a little feedback uh, on uh, CS, it's, it's a great mission area. And within this mission area, we actually have a melting pot of scientists from all different focuses. And within CSS, we also have another program, um, which CSS and now our team is teaming up with, which is known as the Program Data Preservation Informatics and Labs, which is part of the Core Research Center out in Denver. Now, this program is actually involved with the paleo collections that are currently being managed out there and the ones that we're trying to get online and make public. And in addition to that, uh, something that's kind of neat is that program is also executes the National Geological Geophysical Data Preservation Program in which their goal is to make sure data within our various USGS data collections are represented through online digital representations. And this is just a little overview of the core science systems conceptual model. I just thought it would be nice to have something visual for you guys to see, but I'm not going to go into it. Now, the next slide is the goals for this project. Um, now, I'm not sure if, I, I imagine most of you are aware, but USGS has a fundamental responsibility for managing all of this paleo information. We have a government mandate that says we have to make this information available. And so what we did was we were able to determine one of the best ways to get this information out and for the community to use it would be to push this data through the best available data systems out there. And what we decided, we actually looked at different systems. Um, we also actually looked at developing our own system. But what it came down to was it seemed paleobiology is a fantastic and integrated database with tons of analytic and visualization tools and paleo information that would be perfect for our taxa and occurrence information. And then we also have CSER which is great for registering um, our locality sample information. So what we decided is we will use these two best inbreed systems to push our information out while we maintain the original information in our own in-house system known as that, um, science base. And in that case, science base is actually our permanent government-based repository. Now, some of the goals that we have for this is will be continued development of the USGS National Paleo Database. Um, we want to advance the digital representations of these sample collections, which is why uh, we want to push this stuff out to PBD. We know 
people go to PBD to look for tax occurrences and identification information. But not only that, the tools that, are, that accompany that data makes it just so much more useful. So for us, it's a no-brainer to go with PBDB. And the same thing goes with CESA. Um, another thing we want to do is make all this paleontological collections and associated data available to the public, not only scientists or educators, but also to the public. And one of the things we're going to do is establish USGS as our long-term repository for this database. So I'll kind of go, you'll see a little bit more of that as we move on with the presentation. And another goal which would increase efficiency on our end is building loading mechanic uh, building loading mechanisms for integrating our collections into other databases using API methods versus going around the front end. So like right now, um, PBDB, they only have a front end interface to upload data. So down the road, we're hoping to work with them and use API methods so we can upload this large data set at once rather than trying to input 10,000 samples separately. Oops, sorry about that, everybody. Now, just to talk about a little bit of the collections that we have, uh, currently we will be working with two collections. And for actually over the past 130 years, the USGS has been collecting and maintaining millions of these discrete geological, paleobiological specimens. Um, some of these specimens actually serve as a basis for geological maps, geochemical databases, and taxa identification, and also could potentially be a treasure trove of new scientific knowledge since some of this data has yet to be made available to the public. Um, here at USGS, we have a number of heterogeneous paleobiology collections, with one of them being in Denver, which Casey, um, Casey McKinney is working with that collection along with Natalie Latish. And we also have another collection we're working with here in Ruston with Laura Babel, which is a calcareous nanofossil collection. And in addition to that, we actually have another large resource, which are the collections that are currently being housed at the Smithsonian. Um, right now, we're working our way systematically through all these collections to ultimately release this information. But right now, Denver and Reston is our initial focus. And I just thought I'd show you, you know, just some of the collections that are housed within our, Destin, our Denver and Reston warehouse. Um, this is not all, but not limited to, I should say. There's plenty more collections, so I just thought I'd throw a few up there for you guys to see. All right. Now, the USGS CSER and Paleobiology Database Collaboration. Um, this collaboration actually uses existing infrastructure of the uh, CSER for Earth System Sample Registration and the Paleobiology Database, which actually already contains much of the fundamental Sorry about that. Fundamental schemas that are necessary to accommodate our USGS records. And both systems actually provide a great, robust user interface and application programming interfaces, which will enable more creative users for discovery by scientists and citizens. Um, and one of the things that kind of goes back to is the analytic tool that PBD, PBDB offers, um, which is just one of many reasons why we thought they would be a great database to store the USGS paleo data. And for the system for earth sample registration, we will be providing just the sample and specimen information. And all this will link together, and you'll kind of see through the next slides how everything links together. The IGSN from CSER can actually link the two systems together right now. Um, we're unable to backtrack from PPDB back to CSER, but that is something we're actually working on in the coming months, so everything is connected. All right, now this right here is just kind of an overview conceptual model of how everything is fit together. Um, down here we have our Denver Core Lab, our rest of the Nano Fossil Lab, where we get our different data from, uh, original inventory spreadsheets. We have ENR reports. Um, 
we have things just on plain text cards. Um, so all that stuff has to be inventory pulled um, into a specific format, whether it be an Excel, a data sheet, something that can be pulled into other databases. So in here in the middle, we have the USGS National Paleontological Database, which is our database, which will be science-based. Science-based will house all the original information and even the new information. Information that comes right back out of CSER will be brought back into science-based. Um, the data that's being plugged into PBDB will be pulled back into science-based. And one of the reasons for that is we have this full spreadsheet from a USGS scientist and only parts of that data will actually be able to feed into PBDB, and part of that data will feed into the CSER database. And we want to make sure we can tie everything together. And so right here, we process our data, and they come from the Denver Core Lab, Rustin Nanofossil Lab. Um, sometimes we have to process scripts. Um, you'll see this in the next few slides, how we process the data to get into the CSER database. And then also feeding into the PBDB database and system for, simple, system for Earth Sample Registration. And over the next few slides, you'll actually see one complete record of how everything is being tied in together. All right, so this is the CSER record. This is actually the very first record we uploaded to CSER. And the funny thing about it is, um, at least to me, was um, when we um, got this registered, I started playing around with the PBDB to kind of see what US GS collections were already registered there, you know, something that we were not a part of. Um, you know, maybe a student from a university was working on a publication and needed that data to analyze, so they went ahead and put the data in PBDB. And luckily for us, the sample was actually already in PD. PBDB, so you'll see it linked in the next slide how it works together. So right here, you can kind of see a close-up. We have a picture of the sample collection, um, the sample name, and then we actually have the IGSM, which is the unique number um, CSER provides to us. And the great thing about this is the relevant links that CSER provides. Um, as you see, the first link is a link to the sample record held with Paleo BioDB and you'll see this on the next page. And I just want to show you, kind of take note, you can see this tab in D4527. And I'm just kind of showing that to show you how it clicks to the next page. And as you see, it's actually the same sample number, D4527. And one of the things, not only do we have to go in and kind of track what's already in paleobiology database, we actually got to go in and kind of validate um, if this information is correct. Um, and one of the things I will actually point out in this collection is where it's actually reposited. Um, as you can see, it says um, USNM, um, and that's actually incorrect. Uh, it should be USGS. So this is, you know, one of the many challenges that we will be kind of weeding out as we go along through this project. Oops, Oops. sorry, I'm going the wrong way, guys. All right, into the next link. Um, we have a link to the publication, and again, this is all within one sample record. So this is actually where that sample was referred to in a publication. Now, not all samples will have a publication, but what we're hoping to is to be able to attach these publications. The most publications that we will attach to these samples will come from the USGS Pubs Warehouse. And then we have an ENR report. And this is how it will display in ScienceBase. Again, ScienceBase will be our long-term repository for data. And this is kind of neat. This is not even completely finished. Um, it's still kind of a work in progress because one of the things we're trying to figure out is do we want to OCR the, the reports, and I'll show you the report here in a second, or do we want to use a, maybe a team of volunteers to actually extract um, all the bits of information because when you OCR, chances are 
things may get missed, things get, may get misspelled. So it's just one of the things that we're still trying to figure out, untangle the knot, so to say. But the cool thing about this is if you could see the quadrangles here, these are actually the quadrangles where the fossils were pulled within the ENR report. And you'll actually see right here, this is the ENR report. And for some of you that don't know, um, these ENR reports have actually been amassed for over 110 years. They're essentially informal reports on the collections. Um, the collections were submitted by government, industry, uh, field teams that were employed by the survey. Uh, these reports, from my understanding and from what most scientists I've talked to, were required for all USGS scientists that went out to the field for fossil collection. And basically, this was the initial report from their outing. So even though some of this information may have changed, it's still valuable to know what was the initial finding of that scientist and what he thought. So right now we're kind of, you know, working through the process of getting these ENR reports online. Uh, we're working with the Denver ENR report collection right now, which is roughly about 17,000 ENR reports. And we also have two other locations with ENR reports, which my understanding, the range is between 10 to 15,000 at each of those locations. So that will be a, a fun project to work through. All right, and then we have the link to the original data set, which will be science-based. And again, it will be the long-term repository, long -term repository for original data. This is where we will house the data, images, reports, files and data sets of various kinds will be stored here. And the great thing about ScienceBase, it actually provides standard-based catalog services, map services, and other user interfaces. So as we see, this will be the official long-term repository for the MPD. We still want to take advantage of what's out there, the best available distribution services, which we believe is Caesar and PaleoBioDB. And just another little tidbit is um, ScienceBase is actually undergoing a little bit of facelift uh, within the next few months to improve the digital representation of the data. So that's something kind of exciting that will be coming up in a few months. We'll actually kind of make maybe, you know, the ENR reports a little bit more visual and a little bit more useful for down the road. Now, USGS GitHub R script, I kind of threw this um, at the end. Um, this right here um, is an R script I created and put on GitHub. It's public domain. Anybody can get to it. And basically what I was able to do was use R script to take a USGS paleo data sheet and then go ahead and map it to the, U, um, the Caesar schema. And so there's a few tweaks you have to make because sometimes you know, the naming convention may be different or a little bit, but ultimately it will take this data sheet and merge it into a Caesar ready format with a click of a button. And it's actually saved me quite a bit of time. Now that being said, it's, you still have to use human intervention to check certain things, but for the most part, this script right here saves quite a bit of time. And this is something um, we will hope to apply to the PBDB um, database, too, once we're maybe able to get an API or something of that nature to upload bulk records at a time. Now, looking ahead, um, this is something that just came up within the past few weeks. Um, it's actually a great idea, too. Um, we're thinking about using the Darwin Core Archive standard to prepare the USGS fossil, fossil, ah, fossil specimen data for publishing through GBIF and OBRIS using the IPT framework. And the idea would be we would process this data, it would get, end up being in the IPT Darwin Core Archives, and for those that you don't know, um, the Darwin Archives, Core Archives is a data standard that makes use of Darwin Core terms to produce a single self-contained data set species, occurrence, or checklist data. 
um, essentially a folder with text CSV files that could be the data, and then you can also have an XML file, which informs others how your files are organized. Now, one of the things, some but not all of these collections will actually get registered in CSER and actually get IGSNs, and you'll see why um, when we get to the next bullet. Uh, that being said, we are planning to work out a process where these IGSN numbers will get ingested back into the Darwin archive so then that they can then be registered into paleobiology database. They will also include tax identification information, sample information, and the IGSN number. So really with this, you know, integrated publishing toolkit, um, we're not really changing the outcome per se. Um, we're just really trying to accommodate our USGS records Oops, sorry about that. We're just trying to better, you know, refine our system. And we actually kind of believe that the Darwin Core Standard can suffice as a robust data exchange format for the USGS and PD, along with PBDB and the CSER registry. And in addition to that, these records will also get into GBIF, which is another great database. And there's also potentially another um, set of databases that could potentially pull this information if need be. Now, one of the reasons not all collections will be registered through CSER is if we just so happen to have a data set with no associated samples, so there would be nothing to register within CSER, or what happens is the sample itself just references a drawer or cabinet that has specimens in it, but from a standpoint of inventory records collection, we really have nothing to serve up. Um, because if you have 15 samples at one sample number, it would make it pretty hard to track, especially when some of these samples have been dispersed throughout the United States. So that's kind of one of the tangles that we're trying to untie, trying to work through. So because of this, this is actually one of the issues right here um, would be one of the main drivers for taking a hard look at the Darwin Court Standard because it could actually serve both purposes. Now, challenges. Um, I probably could have made this slide a little bit longer, so I'll just keep it a little bit short. Uh, one of the challenges I, I kind of touched on would, would be working through the OCR, um, you know, optical character recognition. recognition. Uh, the vast number of ENR reports right now we have 16 to 17,000 just in Denver. Um, the OCR would actually only be able to pull a certain amount of information. So again, we're trying to, you know, figure out the best way to do it. Do we want to pull just, you know, the basic information or do we want to try to extract everything we can to uh, make that available to the public? Uh, another challenge that we have, uh, I kind of touched on too, is the samples at different locations across the United States. Not only do we have just collections, you know, say at the Smithsonian, Denver, Reston, and from my understanding, we even have collections out in Milano Park. Um, you know, tying all these collections together, or if you just have one sample collection, maybe one rock that at one point was considered a sample and then it was broken out and moved, you know, spread out across the United States. So you have one of the samples at the Smithsonian, one here. And, one in Denver, you know, how do you track all that? So that's one of the things we're kind of working through right now, uh, identifying USGS sample collections within other databases. Um, I kind of touched on that with the, the paleobiology database and the carbon sample that I was working with. Um, we actually, at first when we started registering with CSER, we had no idea that uh, the carbon record was in PBDB. I mean, we did have an idea that we knew USGS records were in it, but we had no idea um, that the records we are currently working with were in it. So that's something 
we have to go back in one to identify to try to make sure we do not duplicate records, but also to even validate that what's already out there is correct. Kind of like the, the mistake I showed you before where the repository was. And another thing, which isn't really a huge challenge, but I'm sure everybody comes across it, is the various information models being used in USGS by paleontology inventories. Um, you know, some person will use one word, some person will use another. Country versus countries, uh, geological age versus geological time. Um, so trying to get everybody on the same page will probably never happen, but trying to work through the different models, and it has been getting easier as it's been going along. So that, that's a great thing. And then also, um, it kind of goes back to what I was saying in the beginning about keeping the USGS paleontological record straight. Um, this will actually, to me, be one of the biggest challenges we will face is keeping these records straight. And the reason for that is we have to understand what's already out there, what we have to contribute, and then we have to keep everything straight with what's already out there and what we plan to contribute in the future, what people have already contributed, and what we plan to contribute in our own data systems. So to me, this is going to be a huge challenge for us, but from a user perspective, we think setting it up this way, um, it's the best way to to go about it, especially for our users, but in the long run, it may, you know, present a few challenges along the way. So that that's going to probably be our biggest challenge is keeping all these records straight as we push our data into these different data systems, whether it be IPT, uh, Caesar, PBDB. You know, keeping everything tied together is is going to be a, a, a challenge. And thank you for your time, and any questions or comments are encouraged. And just to let you guys know, if I'm unable to answer the question, I will defer to Sky Bristol. Sorry, Sky. Ricardo, great. Thank you very much for your presentation. And again, if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat window. So the first question, Ricardo, is, you mentioned millions of samples. What percentage of the collections do you think will be exposed through PBDB and CSAR um, eventually? Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, ultimately, our goal would be for all the information. Um, but I think right now we have to work with almost the collections that are easily readable or easily available, um, easily to work with. Um, but our goal is to you know, have a database where we can track every sample that the USGS has collected, maintained, pushed to the Smithsonian, because at some point down the road, maybe not now, maybe not 10 years from now, um, these samples can and probably will be useful for other people. So getting the work done now, even if it's for all of it, um, will be useful for the future. Hopefully I answered that question correctly. Well, you didn't give a number, but that's very understandable. Well, the okay. number I do not know. Um, maybe yeah, I would okay. know, but a number I do not know. No, I, it, you know, we are working with, as Ricardo said, those inventories where already quite a lot of work has been done and, and uh, quality control to um, you know, be you know very sure of what we have and and uh, what we have in the record for uh, the tax identification and that sort of thing. So those are what we're working for. Uh, but it is going to be you know a decade long process, quite honestly, before uh, we are you know approaching you know somewhere above seventy five percent of this. All right. Um, the next question is: How many people do you have working on this effort? Since it's such a huge effort. Yeah, that's the funny thing. Um, ooh, we have a, a few people. We have myself. We have Sky Bristol. We have Natalie Latish. She's actually on the phone. She's actually a, a newcomer onto the project that I'm very excited about. She's working out in the Denver Core Research Lab with 
Kevin McKinney, which is um, one of the scientists, uh, one of the fossil collectors out there that we're working with. So that is phenomenal. We also have Laurel by Bell, uh, or, and then we also have, you know, a few people from PBDB uh, and a few people from Caesar. So I would say maybe eight to 10 people, maybe a few more. But that being said, um, I can't think of one person that is working full time on this project. So hopefully, right. hopefully down Sorry. the road, maybe we can get some more funding and get a, a few full-time people or even a, a group of volunteers to even help out with this effort. Uh, that's one avenue I know we, we're thinking about pursuing down the road. All right, that sounds good. And the last question I have here is, um, you sort of mentioned that these samples are useful for scientific research. Uh, usually for the samples you've been talking about, how would one go about requesting the sample, samples or gaining access to them if they discovered them through any one of the, the interfaces that they're discoverable in? Well, the CSER registration will provide a name and email where you can contact the person that is in hold of that sample. So right now, uh, one of the things we want to do is try to backtrack back to CSER from PBDB, because right now if you go to the paleobiology database and look at the USGS uh, sample records, there would be no way to find out how you could find that physical sample or even if there was a physical sample. But with the CSER registry, you would be able to track down through the multiple links um, where that sample is located. Okay, well, thank you again to both of our speakers today. Uh, just a reminder, this webinar will be available later, both at the EarthCube website and the C4P YouTube channel. And there's a few more webinars left in this spring series, so please check the webinar schedule at the earthcube.org site. But other than that, thanks for attending, um, and see you next time. Thanks, Leslie.